Good evening, Bahamas. Coming up tonight on Our News. One man in custody in relation to the alleged sexual attacks of three preteen girls. The opposition fans the flames, calling for a select committee to review the Oban Energies deal. The first named storm of the 2018 hurricane season may bring heavy rain to the area. Plus, Fit Fridays challenges a queen for the crown. Our news is brought to you by Alive. Welcome to our news and thanks for joining us. I'm Christina Dragovich. Topping news tonight, police tonight have a young man in custody in relation to the alleged sexual attacks of three preteen girls. Police made the arrest of a juvenile male in his mid-teens shortly after 5 p.m. today. CDU Chief Superintendent Solomon Cash says police believe the juvenile is responsible for all the attacks and the investigation is ongoing. This development comes after a young girl was reportedly attacked in the Big Pond area yesterday. Jared Higgs has been following this sexual assault investigation and filed this report. This sketch, released by police on Friday morning, shows the man they believe to be responsible for the rape of a 12-year-old girl that took place in the area of Big Pond on Thursday afternoon. Now, police say the 12-year-old victim and her brother were walking on a dirt road like this one in the Big Pond area when they were accosted by a man. The brother went running for help, leaving the sister alone where she was sexually assaulted by the suspect. Residents in the area say the entire Big Pond Park is prone to crimes of opportunity due to the secluded nature of the walkways that surround the pond. One resident, called T, says less than two months ago he encountered two young girls who told him they narrowly escaped an attack. The one one run to me one time say if I see a fella run this way when I was walking through, the time I was taking the cut I was going out there to see the volume. Was they run to me and I asked him what happened, they asked me if I had any phone. I said yes I have a phone. Say, she said, sister, a man just try to run after them in the back there. They was run, had some, one, one scrape was halfway down and the next one was, and they was in the back. They say, no, I haven't seen the, the man, but I would advise you all not to walk in the back here again. Another area resident who called himself Dr. King says he heard similar stories of attempted assaults in the area. Yeah, the girls pass, say, we talk to them, tell them don't walk that road, okay? Because here, you know, nothing really happened this way, okay? But that particular road, take your the road traffic from the basketball court, that's a crime road. Do you think that is a risk of girls? Good, yes, man. Yeah, because some, some girls told us, told us about it. What did they tell you? You know, that it was a guy who was taking his clothes off and calling them to molest them, right? Then there's that other guy who was calling them. Say, come on, I guess I'm in this and that. So I talked to Clay Fernando about it, tell him how police patrol from the basketball court. That, that road particular, the dog taking the road job, but that particular we need police. Police say they aren't certain whether this attack is related to two sexual assaults that took place early last week and on the last Saturday in April. Last week, police say a 12-year-old girl was walking on Darling Street near Stephen Dillett Primary School when she was sexually assaulted by a man. In the April 28th incident, officers say an 8-year-old girl was attacked on Bahama Avenue. The child's grandfather told our news that the perpetrator, who he described as a beast, pulled the girl's underwear down before being scared off. Police were criticized when it was revealed that the April 28th incident was not reported to the media until May 14th. Founder of the crisis center, Dr. Sandra Dean Patterson, chastised police, stating that their failure to report the earlier incident was consistent with a pattern of underreporting sex crimes. Police took a 32-year-old man into custody earlier this week in relation to those two earlier incidents. However, he was released. Reporting for our news, I'm Jared Higgs. In other news, two months after the Bahamas was added to the European Union's list of non-cooperative jurisdictions for tax purposes, the Ministry of Finance is reporting that the Bahamas has been removed. Our Jillian Gray has more. The European Union's decision to remove the Bahamas from its blacklist is being celebrated by the Ministry of Finance as a result of excellent coordination and cooperation by ministers and their technical teams. Now, while this recent move is being praised by the government, Bahamas Institute of Chartered Accountants President Gawin Bo says this bit of breathing room should not be over-celebrated. We have to be very careful about what I would call jubilation. Like I've seen 
headlines and, and um, actual communication saying removed. And I think we have to be very careful that it's not that we've been removed from their scope. We have simply been removed from the listing that they have said is non-compliant. Bo says if the Bahamas is serious about being a financial services center, then politics must be set aside, meaning the government should not be overzealous in their self-congratulatory remarks and the opposition shouldn't try to degrade the move that's been made. The Bahamas has until December 2018 to fully comply with the EU, but some are questioning if the EU stipulations are too steep. So if we are asking to play in their sandbox, we have to play by their rules. And whilst those rules may not be what we believe are equitable, then there's a very simple answer on their side, don't play in my sandbox. The opposition has called for the government to state what commitments it made to be removed from the European Union's blacklist. What has to be balanced is an understanding and an education of what the commitments are, because we have very emotive responses. So as soon as we hear anything about taxation, you already but I would say lose sight of the principle and get caught up in the details of something that has not even yet been agreed. So what government has is the tremendous task of saying, well, these are the elements we committed, but this is why we've done so. And this is why we believe it will still be conducive to what our International Financial Service Center is to be. Today, the Ministry of Finance noted that the Bahamas remains committed to meeting and exceeding global standards of conduct and cooperation in tax matters, and to the timelines set for technical compliance and legislation to affect the same. Now, some persons have criticized the proposed changes, saying it will cause international companies to pull out of the Bahamas. When you change laws and regulations, there's going to be some, what I call, casualties. Now, it's more around saying, are we doing something that is, if you will, more restrictive than compliant jurisdictions. And so there's this balance of saying, well, how do I demonstrate compliance and willingness um, to comply with what is being pushed out uh, versus being the first one out of the gate where people leave go to another jurisdiction. Now, while the Bahamas and St. Kitts and Nevis have been removed from the European Union's blacklist and placed on its gray list, it's important to note that countries who are on the European Union's gray list can be placed back on the blacklist if they do not honor their commitments. Reporting for Our News, I'm Gillian Gray. While members of the opposition are expressing outrage over Parliament's decision to not appoint a select committee to probe Oban, Anglerson Member of Parliament Glennis Hannah-Martin says it's not just the decision that was upsetting, but the dismissive manner in which it was handled. This as Progressive Liberal Party Deputy Leader Chester Cooper says the opposition will continue to fan the flames and is even considering initiating a judicial review on the controversial project. Jasmine Brown reports. Why? Why doesn't the government want an objective scrutiny? You're not going to create anything. You're going to just see what the facts are. Why wouldn't they want the facts ventilated? Why? Hannah Martin was the MP who moved the ill-fated motion in the House of Assembly on Wednesday. All 25 government MPs present voted against the appointment of the select committee. The four opposition MPs voted in favor. What really surprised me was not just the, the, the no, no vote, it was the conduct of members during the proceedings, the heckling, the disruptions, um, all around. Had it been appointed, the committee would have examined all matters related to the proposed Oban project, reviewed the circumstances in regard to the signing of the Oban Heads of Agreement, and reviewed and inquired into whether the tabling of the agreement constituted an intentional misleading of the House of Assembly. The government signed the Heads of Agreement with Oban Energies for the $5.5 billion oil refinery and storage facility for East Grand Bahama on February 10th. Nine days later, the Minnes administration held a ceremonial signing with Oban Energy's non-executive chairman, Peter Krieger. Since then, the project has been plagued with issues, and after weeks of pressure, Minnes admitted his government made mistakes with the Oban deal. Dubious nature of the reputation of the principles, um, the inconsistent stories, the, the strange contents of the heads of agreement, the removal of the best commission, into the office of the Prime Minister, the, the, the off-the-wall um, provisions for the environment. Um, when you look at the concerns of the Bahamas National Trust, 
um, advocates in the in the community that live in that area. When you look at all of these things, it, it just I, I, I am very, very baffled at why the government chose not to provide for transparency in this matter. This is not the first time a motion for a select committee into a controversial matter has been shot down. In April 2015, under the former Christie administration, former Fort Charlotte MP Andre Rollins called for a select committee to probe the Rubus oil leak. Despite his impassioned speech, the majority of parliamentarians voted against the formation of the select committee to investigate the spill at the service station at Robinson and Old Trail Roads. Fifteen PLP MPs voted no, including current PLP leader Philip Brave Davis. Hannah Martin was not present for the vote. Meantime, PLP Deputy Leader Chester Cooper says the fight does not end here for the PLP, as they will continue to hunt the FNM on the matter until all the facts are revealed. We have the avenue of now attempting to probe using the Public Accounts Committee. Uh, we've been stonewalled before by the government uh, in terms of executing our, our duties and responsibilities in this committee. Uh, they might leave us no choice but to cause a, a judicial review uh, to happen. Uh, I believe uh, that might be the, the only outcome. PLP leader Philip Brave Davis told the Nassau Guardian yesterday that he has advised members of the Public Accounts Committee that he plans on raising the Oban issue when they meet on Tuesday. Reporting for our news, I'm Jasmine Brown. Two men from Grand Bahama were brought before the magistrate's court today on drug-related charges. 21-year-old Malik Lang of Gilbert Crest in the orange shirt and 28-year-old Arsenio McKinney in the blue-striped shirt were charged before magistrate Subasola Swain on one count of possession of dangerous drugs with the intent to supply, one count of conspiracy to possess dangerous drugs with intent to supply, one count of conspiracy to export dangerous drugs, and one count of taking preparatory steps to export dangerous drugs, namely cocaine. Lang was represented by attorney Tamar Moss and McKinney was represented by attorney Brian Hanna. Both men pleaded not guilty to all charges and were remanded until they returned to court on September 18, 2018. While well, investigators are looking into the cause of a fire that ripped through an abandoned Okra Hill building this afternoon. Fire Chief Superintendent Walter Evans says fire services was called to the scene shortly after 1 p.m. where they met the three-story building, formerly the City Lodge Meat and Convenience Store, ablaze. We met heavy smoke and flames coming from the top section of the roof of the northern section of the facility. Additional resources were called in to assist in suppressing this fire to ensure that the fire did not spread to affect any of the nearby residents which are located on the northern end and on the southern end. Now police are not sure what caused the fire but Evan says they have ruled out one source. We cannot say with certain what has been the cause of this. What we can, what we can say to you is that this building has not been powered with electricity. Um, which is an indication that the fire may have been caused by some other means. As you can see, the facility is unsecured and it allows um, persons who do not have no fixer board to move in and out freely. And uh, at this point, we suspect that, that those persons may have been responsible for causing um, this fire to have taken place. Evan says interviews are now being conducted with area residents to determine if vagrants in the area may be linked to the incident. Meanwhile, he says the integrity of the structure has been compromised by the fire. And there may be a slightly above average hurricane season ahead this year as forecasters are predicting 14 named storms, 7 hurricanes and 3 major hurricanes. This comes as the first named storm of the 2018 hurricane season has formed in the Western Caribbean, expected to bring heavy rain over the weekend. Subtropical storm Alberto is expected to bring heavy rainfall to South Florida, which may bring showers and thunderstorms into the area throughout the weekend. It's the first named storm of the season, which forecasters expect to be above average this year. Meteorologist Greg Thompson gave on-the-record host Jerome Sawyer a snapshot of what's ahead. So the last couple of years were very busy years. We had three years consecutively where we had a hurricane impact the Bahamas. This year, we're asking, we're employing the public to prepare themselves for another active season.
Alberto formed in the Western Caribbean, which Thompson says is typical of systems that form in the early part of the hurricane season. As the hurricane season progresses and reaches its peak in early to mid-September, Thompson says there's a shift in where storms are formed. In the latter part of the season, they tend to move back towards our area, nearer to the Bahamas, into the Caribbean, and back into the Gulf of Mexico. So those are the uh, occurrences um, where the hurricanes tend to form and where they move across the Atlantic. The ones that are out there in the open Atlantic, those are the ones that we fare mostly and uh, they tend to uh, generate during the peak of the season. The region saw two major Category 5 hurricanes last year, Irma and Maria. Warmer seas, which may be attributed to climate change, create perfect conditions for storm formation and typically lead to above-average hurricane seasons. Take into uh, account uh, some of the um, effects of uh, La Nina, El Nino in the Pacific. Of course, uh, if you do have an El Nino, we do have it tends to produce stronger upper level winds in the atmosphere, which tends to share hurricanes during the season. So when we do see the El Nino effect in the uh, Pacific, that spells good news for us. You only need one system to move into your, into your area to be a major or at least a busy season. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have um, two islands nearby that tend to uh, protect us during the season. That's Hispaniola and Cuba. They have some very tall mountains. So when we do get systems, tracking towards those islands. They, they favor us a lot more, but if they stay on the Atlantic and avoid those islands, that's the uh, scenario that we most fear. On the Record airs Thursdays right here on RTV. Still to come on our news, a Fit Fridays challenge like you've never seen before, plus celebrating 10 years of a local radio station. That and more when our news returns. <laughs>